As of July 12, 2015, approximately 13,000 products contain at least one non-nutritive sweetener or artificial sweetener. As aspartame side effects and dangers percolate in the media, it begs the question, is aspartame bad for you? And even more importantly, is aspartame bad for kids? In this episode of The Nourished Child, I'm digging into aspartame, what it is, where it's found, and everything I think you should know to make decisions about aspartame in your child's diet. Welcome to The Nourished Child Podcast, a show about childhood nutrition, feeding kids, and dealing with the ups and downs of growing a healthy child. Here's your host, registered dietitian and childhood nutrition expert, Jill Castle. Hey friends, I'm Jill Castle, a pediatric dietitian, mom to four kids, and host of this podcast. I started this podcast in 2016 as a way to help families and healthcare professionals learn more about nutrition and feeding kids. My goal has always been to make nourishing your families easier through breaking down science into understandable concepts you can put into practice right away and shedding light on and improving the emotional well-being of kids through feeding and food. You can always go deeper on my website, thenourishchild.com, where I have resources for children ages birth through teen. I'm always so, so grateful you're here, and I hope you enjoy the show. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Nourish Child podcast. I hope you are having a fabulous summer. It's getting hot up here in the Massachusetts area. Even though I'm on the water, I still have mosquitoes and hot, sweaty days. So I hope you're enjoying the sun, the fun, the cool water, wherever you are. I hope you're safe. I hope your kids are safe and all is well in your world. So I wanted to talk about aspartame today because it has been the hot topic in the media lately. As I was doing research for this episode and in full disclosure, I recognized one of my favorite sodas, Fresca, is something that contains aspartame, and I happen to be drinking it right now as I record this podcast. I probably consume probably three to five cans of Fresca a week. It's the only soda I really drink, and of all the food products I consume and buy for my family, our tendency to consume diet sodas contribute the most artificial sweeteners to my, to my loved ones. So I kept this in mind as I dug into the research around aspartame and children. So before we talk about this, I I thought it might be helpful for you to just take a moment and think about the reduced calorie diet foods and drinks that you might be buying today. This will help you keep a realistic perspective on aspartame. So what is aspartame? It's an artificial sweetener. It's about 180 to 200 times sweeter than sugar, so a little bit goes a long way. And it's basically a white powder that's odorless and has no calories. It is sold under the commercial name NutraSweet Equal or Sugar Twin, and it was initially approved by the Food and Drug Administration for limited use as a tabletop sweetener in 1981. Then it was approved for general use, for example, in foods and beverages, in 1996. Aspartame is added to drinks, foods like desserts, sweets, chewing gum, sugar-free ice cream, reduced calorie fruit juices, light yogurt and other similar dairy products, low-calorie or diet foods like reduced sugar ketchup, sugar-free salad dressing, and it can be used as a sugar substitute, which can be added to foods, think like oatmeal or other beverages like your coffee or your tea in the morning. Manufactured products or the foods that you'll buy and see in the grocery store that contain aspartame or other non-nutritive sweeteners are not required to specify the amount in the food product which, of course, makes it challenging to know exactly how much you're consuming or your child is consuming. But in the United States, aspartame 
must be labeled on food products in the ingredient list or on the label itself. Like I said, a lot of diet sodas can have aspartames, things like Diet Coke, Fresca, Diet Dr. Pepper, Tab. We also see it in Jell-O, the sugar-free Jell-O, and for kids who like country time lemonade, sugar-free lemonade, aspartame is included in that product as well. But let's really talk about safety. Is aspartame safe for kids? Well, when we look at the Food and Drug Administration stance on aspartame, they have approved aspartame and most artificial sweeteners as safe for consumption. Now, other artificial sweeteners like saccharin and sucralose have been suspected as increasing cancer risk based on rodent studies, but more research has debunked this notion. So overall, the body of evidence does not support a cancer risk in humans at this time. I even went to the American Cancer Society, who states on their website that they rely on other organization to guide its position on cancer risk with regards to aspartame. And here's what they say. And I've included the link in this blog post for you if you want to dive into it. But they say, and they quote on their website, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, or FDA, has concluded that, quote, the use of aspartame as a general purpose sweetener is safe, unquote. Also, the European Food Safety Authority, or EFSA, has stated, quote, Studies do not suggest an increased risk associated with aspartame consumption for leukemia, brain tumors, or a variety of cancers, including brain, lymphatic, and hemopoietic or blood cancers. So what about all this talk we hear about complications or side effects related to ADHD in kids? There is high-quality research that indicates there is no association between aspartame and ADHD development or the worsening of ADHD symptoms, birth defects, diabetes, and lupus in children. This has all been refuted in the research, according to a position paper from the American Academy of Pediatrics on the safety of artificial sweeteners in kids. Again, if you want the link to this position paper, I will include it over on my blog, thenourishchild.com. I'll have an associated article on the website with this audio recording, so you can see the links to the research if you want to go diving into them. Kids change a lot. Their nutrition needs, eating habits, and food preferences do too. So much so, it can be hard to keep up. The Nourish Child, a website designed for parents who want more nutrition education, helps parents like you get crystal clear on raising good eaters. We've cracked the code on nourishing the whole child, whether you're raising a baby, a teen, or a child with health concerns. Our nutrition school and parent education programs help you get the inside scoop on food and nutrients, positive food parenting, and building self-motivated, autonomous kids who are good eaters. Visit thenourishchild.com today. However, the AAP also states that for kids, long-term research and data is lacking. We just don't have a lot of research in children. They quote, and I quote them, quote, in summary, observational data in adult human studies show no association between non-nutritive sweetener use and cancer. There are no long-term studies in children. Studies have been limited to animal and adult human studies, and the long-term risk of cancer and other conditions among children who use non-nutritive sweeteners is not known and is likely to be difficult to obtain, end quote. I also went and I dug into some of the European Union information because they are right now doing a re-evaluation of its safety, and they've been doing this work since about 2017. In 2013, they did aspartame itself, underwent a thorough re-evaluation of its safety, and the EU found it to be safe for the general population, including infants, children, and pregnant women. However, since 2017, the EU has been re-examining aspartame 
particularly the salt of aspartame. It's called aspartame asulfame, and I hope I said that right. Aspartame asulfame, a derivative of aspartame and the amounts available in food products. So they're basically looking at the salt of aspartame and its safety, but they're also evaluating trying to get a handle on how much aspartame is actually in food products. Because there's no requirement really to label the quantity and the amount included, it's hard to know. So what is the recommended dose of aspartame in the United States? Well, it's, it's called an acceptable daily intake or an ADI. And the ADI is 50 milligrams per kilo of body weight. This is a limit set by the FDA. What does that really mean? Well, if you look at a 150-pound adult, it is about 165 packets of NutraSweet or equal, or it's 18 cans of diet soda. Okay, so that is a lot of soda and a lot of sugar packets, or sugar substitute packets, rather. And that's considered an, an acceptable intake or an acceptable level of consumption in a day. So I don't think any of our kids are getting anywhere near that amount of sugar substitute or diet sodas in a day. As a point of comparison, the European Union sets a lower level. So they set their limit at 40 milligrams per kilo body weight. And again, just as a reminder, the U.S., the FDA, sets it at 50. They say this also is way higher than an actual person's typical consumption. So what this all means is that both the U.S. and Europe consider a daily acceptable limit of around 40 milligrams per kilo of body weight, actual body weight for Europe, and 50 milligrams per kilo of actual body weight for the United States. And both of them agree that that level of consumption for most individuals is just not happening. So that's good news. Who should avoid aspartame? So there are a subset of children and adults who should be avoiding aspartame, and those are kids with PKU. PKU stands for phenylketonuria. These kids cannot break down an amino acid called phenylalanine, and this amino acid is found in aspartame. So the good news here is that labels are required, as I mentioned, to call out the presence of aspartame. And if you're looking at the label, it will say contains phenylalanine. It may also say it contains aspartame as well. But for the purpose of protecting those children and adults and other individuals with PKU, the label is very explicit, contains phenylalanine. So there's always this question about sugar substitutes. I used to get it a lot when I was in private practice. And it was, you know, the question around, should my larger bodied child use a sugar substitute? Will it help with their health? Will it cause weight loss? And again, if you look at the overall research and the evidence, it suggests in children particularly that the use of artificial sweeteners, particularly when they substitute for real sugar, these can induce weight stabilization or a small degree of weight loss of about two pounds in children and teens. And this is, again, due to the fact that you're swapping out real sugar for a sugar substitute in the regular diet, and that creates a net calorie deficit. But you can see two pounds is not that much weight loss, and it is the impact and the effect is not that great. There are other considerations as well that you should be thinking about when it comes to use of aspartame. Number one, artif or other artificial sweeteners as well. Artificial sweeteners like aspartame train the palate to prefer sweet foods. So it changes the taste preferences and changes in the favor of sweeter foods. Also, it's not possible to really measure right now exactly how much aspartame is consumed and compare that to the recommended daily limits, although most experts and most of the science agrees that humans are not consuming near the acceptable daily intake. However, there are many food products and beverages that contain artificial sweeteners, and these are widely available. So the accumulation from a variety of different foods and beverages 
might be something to think about. As a result, parents are concerned. They're worried about the safety, despite hundreds of studies and safety declarations from very well-respected organizations. So I've put together a couple of recommendations just to, to help maybe ease, ease your thinking about aspartame and sort of sort some of the stuff out. First off, don't fear aspartame. It's largely regarded as safe, and the evidence in adults suggests that it's safe. And even though we don't have long-term studies on children, I think the whole idea of the dose makes the poison is very relevant to this conversation. So you can, as with all foods, moderation is the key. It's not sexy, but moderation, I think, is the best approach. Not restriction, so not this, oh my gosh, we can't have anything with aspartame, and not excessive consumption either. I think there's somewhere in the middle there. I'll call it moderation. You could call it somewhere in the middle. Um, whatever works for you, but I think that's the best approach. Again, a wide variety of foods in your diet is probably the most protective approach you can take to any of these sort of concerning substances in our, our food supply. The last thing I would advise you is if you are worried, take a quick assessment of the foods in your kitchen and on your regular shopping list and see what might be carrying an artificial sweetener in it. Just be more aware. Have your eyes wide open. If you didn't know that light yogurt had artificial sweeteners in it or aspartame in it, well, now you know. So if you're looking at sort of what's in your kitchen, it's just important to understand what's there and where aspartame and other artificial sweeteners may be living. If you're uncomfortable with the amounts, cut down. Switch to real sugar-containing products and work to keep all of the foods in balance, especially sweets and treats, with all the other foods your child is consuming. So you have the knowledge and the evidence. Again, I will post the research. I will post a blog about this. So if you want to walk through it and read it, it'll be a little bit more developed um, than this podcast. I encourage you to go over to thenourishchild.com and read that post. You can also listen to this audio on podcasts wherever you listen to podcasts, but sometimes people want to hear this information. Sometimes people want to also be able to read and look at the studies. I encourage you to do that too. It will help set your mind at ease. That's it for today, folks. I hope you found this information helpful. It is a little bit more nuanced with children. A lot of what's out there in the media right now is focused on adults. And the fact is, we just don't have a lot of evidence in children. And that's the case with a lot of things, frankly. But I think you can rest assured that your strategies with food balance and food variety and being moderate and inclusive of all foods, that really is the best strategy for protecting your children from any harm, from any sort of other substances that may be in question. Okay. That's it for today. I hope you're enjoying the summer. I'll be back in two weeks. Thank you for listening and be sure to give that child in your life a loving squeeze today. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to the Nourish Child Podcast, where the number one goal is to help you grow a nourished child inside and out. <laughs>